before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. Welcome to Season 7. And for this, our extraordinary 98th episode, we've got a great guest. It's Bill McKibben, writer and activist. As a writer, Bill has written 20 books on the environment, climate change and society, including the seminal End of Nature in 1989. That was the first mainstream book on climate change. As an activist, Bill founded 350.org, which was back at the time of the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009 to put pressure on politicians to reach an ambitious deal. Then he was at the heart of forming the divestment movement and more recently, Third Act, for older Americans and people around the world to remain engaged in the most crucial issues of the day. Please welcome Bill McKibben to Cleaning Up. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, you're somewhere in, um, I'm guessing, uh, the Northeast. Um, which state are you in? Whereabouts are you today? Up in the Green Mountain state of Vermont, uh, the second smallest state in the Union, but, a, uh, but mighty despite our size. And, and it looks like behind you, through the window there, I can see some kind of a mountain. Is that that will be the Green Mountains that you're talking about there? Exactly right. These are... Uh, and at this time of year, they're at their, you know, luscious peak. Uh, all the it'll be another, another ten or fifteen days, and the trees will start to turn, and you know, uh, Vermont will get into its fall glory. But right now, we're at high summer. Right. I spent some time uh, hanging out in Vermont when I was at business school. I was I was in Boston, but uh, Vermont very lovely, uh, as you say, at this time of year. What you can't see because it's on the other side of the uh, the camera is that out of that window there, we've got also some green mountains. I'm in Switzerland, I'm up in the Alps, and I look out onto green, and then it's brown, and it's supposed to be white. There is a glacier yes. up there, which is shrinking very rapidly as we speak, which could not be more uh, on message for this conversation. Exactly right. And I, I, I fear it's been a tough summer for the uh, glaciers of the Alps, uh, just as it's been a tough summer for the rivers of Europe, <laughs> and really a tough summer in an extraordinary number of places. Um, the, the daily reality now of what climate change in its early stages looks like, I think, is starting to sink in. And uh, bad as it's been in Europe or in America, uh, the heat wave currently underway in China may turn out to be the most climatically significant heat wave we've yet recorded. Uh, and the drought underway in the Horn of Africa, um, where we're headed into a fifth rainy season with no rain, I, 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 I'm afraid is an example of the kind of um, stress that the poorest and most vulnerable places now are starting to really uh, uh, succumb to. Yeah, it has certainly been a an apocalyptic summer, and it just feels like it's been a kind of a relay race, a baton race, because we started with India and Bangladesh. We've had the the, the Europe uh, droughts, the water level dropping in the Rhine. We've had, as you say, the uh, the the situation in China, which is now really gathering pace, and um, uh, you know, and also um, you know, it just it just seems to sort of never stop. And the Horn of Africa has been going, and in fact, we had a um, a guest, uh, Elizabeth Wathuti, who's from Kenya. Uh, over a year ago, and she was already talking about it back then. Um, let's do the following, because I have this very broad audience, and some of them will know exactly who you are, and some of them, you know, that's the joy of a broad audience, will be sitting there going, so who is this guy, you know, sitting up there in Vermont, and uh, they may know you for one or two things. They may know you for 350.org or, or for, uh, you know, for, for perhaps one of your books. But can I ask you in your words to give a thumbnail, who is Bill McKibben? Sure. In, in relation to this issue of climate change, I wrote the first book for a general audience about what we then called the greenhouse effect back in 1989, a book called The End of Nature that ended up in 24 languages and, you know, read all over the world. And uh, really, I was in my 20s then, so most of my life then has been devoted to this question, as with you. 
And uh, what I started doing about 15 years ago was some of the first large scale organizing uh, movement building around climate change, because I'd come to believe that the power of the fossil fuel industry was preventing us from making change at the pace that we needed to. And so to build a kind of countervailing power, we started first an organization called 350.org that was the first iteration of a global climate movement. We've organized 20,000 demonstrations in every country in the world except North Korea. Uh, we helped spearhead the fight against what was called the Keystone Pipeline here in the US that became the first significant defeat for big oil. And we launched this massive fossil fuel divestment campaign now at about $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have sold their stock in coal or oil or gas. And at the moment, um, because I'm old now, uh, we're organizing, we're building an organization called Third Act that takes people over the age of 60 and tries to bring their political and financial power to bear on these questions. Very good. Um, uh, I very much like a um, Boston-based beer called Sam Adams. And every Sam Adams bottle, it says Brewer Patriot. And so for you, I always ask, well, what, what are the two words that would sum up any sort of person or myself? And for you, it seems to be then writer activist. Is that fair? That is fair. Uh, uh, and, uh, and since I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, uh, birthplace of the American Revolution, where Sam Adams used to hang out a lot, uh, uh, I'm willing to take Patriot, too. But I, I'm not much of a brewer, but I do drink a fair amount. So there you go. Very good. But when you started your career as a journalist and then as an author, was it, were you driven, did you see yourself as a sort of observer or did you already think of your writing as a form of activism? No, I was very much a straight ahead journalist. I, I, my first job out of college was at the New Yorker magazine in New York City. I wrote a column called The Talk of the Town. That's the sort of famous column in the front of the New Yorker, which is probably America's preeminent magazine. And uh, uh, it wasn't until I was 25 or 26 and writing The End of Nature that I really began to understand that I cared about the outcome here. Um, I wasn't objective in the sense that journalists sometimes try to be. I, I didn't want the world to overheat and, and blow away. And so that did make it more difficult to just be a straight ahead journalist in quite the same way that I'd expected to in my life. But I continue to do a lot of journalism, including to write a lot for The New Yorker, um, a, 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 even as I a, am also an activist. And um, your, your activism, you've chosen a very sort of a very particular style. I think we'll get on to talking about engagement and how individual, what is individuals uh, responsibility and what are the different kind of theories of change. But before we do that, I want to go back to the end of nature, which must have been quite a sort of life changing event, getting that book out there. And then it, 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 it seems to have been a, a bit of a punctuation point for you. Um, but that is now, uh, you published that in 1989, is that right? Or well, 19 yeah, 30, 33, 33 years ago, yes. And do you ever go back to it and have a look at what you wrote? Or do you remember it all so vividly that you don't need to? I, I do go back and look at it occasionally, in part because it, people keep putting out new editions of it. Uh, Penguin just reissued it as an official Penguin classic. So <laughs> I had to go back and uh, look at and, and, and do a little work on it. It's um, it, the sad part is that the science, we knew everything we needed to know in 1989. And we could and should have gone to work right then and we didn't. And so now we're in a big mess. But the, the science holds up. What's different is that the um, since in 1989, it hadn't yet happened. It, it was the, the, the dominant tone for me in the book was sadness, the sadness at the ways that humans were now taking every inch of the wild world and 
uh, changing it, altering it, um, manipulating it um, by raising the temperature, and changing, therefore, its flora and its fauna and its meaning. And that sadness is still very much with me. But, you know, as climate change has become much more real and concrete, that sadness has been joined by fear at the obvious consequences, uh, by incredible anger at the forces, primarily the fossil fuel industry and their lickspittle politicians who uh, 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 allied themselves with it, who kept us from doing anything about it, and deep, deep sorrow for the millions of people already killed uh, uh, or forced to move or uh, whose lives stunted by an entirely preventable crisis. It's interesting because I read it. I've got that Penguin Classic edition and I yeah. read it in preparation for this conversation. And I was struck by, you know, absolutely that sense of sadness and foreboding. Um, also, by the way, uh, your the, the sense that that you have that that nevertheless there will be a nature it won't be the same nature yes. but there will still be something out there that's that's complex and we will have changed it all and that's very sad but unlike a lot of activists you don't say it's kind of the end of everything no and i don't think it is the end of everything and in fact you know i you know i've spent as much of my life in the natural world as i can which is one reason i've been able to stay sane through all of this um and the though there is no such thing as absolute wilderness anymore the value of relative wilderness seems greater all the time um so uh, I mean, that's why I live where I live. I don't think I would have been able to keep doing the work that I've done at the pace that I've done it if I'd been in the city or something. It's been really important for me to be able to be out in the world that I love. Part of the human, um, part of the human job is to bear witness to the world around us. And it's not getting any more intact or any more beautiful in the future than it is now. So I take seriously the idea that that part of each day is to be spent just um, um, taking stock of, uh, bearing witness to the beauty that it is around us all the time. One of the other things that struck me reading it um, just this week is that you say that the science has held up pretty well. Mm. It, that actually can be split into two pieces. The actual temperatures that we're at and that are now being forecast are not as extreme as the forecasts back when you wrote that book. So you were writing about two degrees to five degrees centigrade in the very near future. And in in I think you call it the near future, which I'm, I, I, I haven't got the exact citation, but I'm assuming is in sort of the decadal time frame. We're only at 1.2 degrees. Um, when people talk about five degrees, now you know the central scenario from the IPCC is consistent with a 2.4 degrees. So that's yeah, kind I of the good that, news. The bad news is all those terrible things that are already happening, which are worse than forecast at the same that's temperature right. levels. That's right. So truthfully, I think the temperature forecast has been pretty much correct. I mean, Jim Hansen's estimate of how much the temperature would go up at the first congressional hearings on this, the bands are about right. Uh, it turns out Exxon's guys who were studying this covertly in the 1980s predicted pretty precisely what the temperature would be by about 2020. So within a, you know, you know, within a relatively, uh, science got that part right. What they got wrong was how much damage would happen with each, each increment of temperature. We didn't understand quite how finely balanced this system was. And so, uh, you know, the temperature increase we've seen so far, you know, on the order of 1.2 degrees Celsius has been enough to trigger truly extraordinary change, um, much more than I, I think we could have imagined. The stuff that we thought would happen in 2060 or 2070 is happening now. Uh, and, and and that's very scary. Uh, it turns out that scientists are very conservative by nature. 
and tend to under predict, not over predict. So I, that's the part that freaks me out about where we are right now, because some of this is, you know, I mean, that we've melted most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic is a very daunting thing um, that we've managed to change as dramatically as we have the planet's hydrological cycle. The way that water moves around the earth is a very daunting thing because these are not easy to reverse in any way. And, and our, it just turns out that our civilization is you know, on fairly uh, shaky ground um, because of the magnitude of these changes. Yeah, I think I, I would go back to, you know, it is, it is it, truly it has been striking that although, you know, some of those forecasts, you know, the, the ones you cite in your book were two to five degrees and things like sea level rise, you, you quote in the book, you cite a, um, uh, an e the EPA report on sea level rise, which was 144 to 217 centimeters by 2100. The current IPCC forecast is actually for 30 to 60 or 60 to 110 in the in a scenario which you know frankly involves burning more coal than exists. So it is it is striking, and I'm, I'm not I'm, I don't want to you know I I don't want to you know dive too much down the rabbit hole because. The, the key point I think that you're making, which I 100% agree with, is that the thing is much more finely balanced than we realized back then. And yes. so the impacts, it's kind of, but it's it's a nuanced point, but it's complicated because the general public, and frankly, a lot of people working in this space, find it hard to distinguish between the emissions scenarios, which are generally actually improving and are not as apocalyptic as was thought, but the impacts and the sensitivities are, and if you want to be kind of, if you really want to follow the science, which we're all told to do, then it's very, then, then people find it hard to distinguish between those two. And I spend yeah, a lot well, of I mean, time the, trying the to explain that. Now, the point is now that you don't really need much forecasting at this point. I mean, all you have to do is just look out the window and see what's happening. I mean, in, in literally in your case, since you can look across at the Alpine glaciers, and and watch them melt so the the role of like which scenario or whatever is it, now that we're actually in the the you know in the rapids uh not no longer in the calm water downstream now we're you know right above the waterfall um the forecasting parts it strikes me as less important what's important is trying to understand uh uh the damage that we're seeing, and more importantly, trying to understand the momentum of it. I think the place where scientists are converging now is an understanding that if we're going to respond effectively, that response has to come quickly. Yep. Um, um, that pace is now the most important of all the variables. That's right. And I had Johan Rockström on yes. cleaning up. And, you know, these things, by the way, what we'll do is we'll pick up these references and we'll put them into the show notes because yes. Johan is absolutely brilliant at the difference between the commitment time he talks about, which is the next few decades when we do irrevocable things and the impact time, which might be two, three, four, five hundred years, possibly even a millennium for some of those really bad things to fully manifest. And, um, yes. and, and he's very clear about that. Yes. The other thing. The other thing, though, that we've come to realize that I think is really important and that physical scientists aren't capable of capturing is that the political arrangements of a planet are more fragile than we'd realized, too. So, for instance, um, you have uh, the worst drought in the history of what we used to call the Fertile Crescent centered on Syria. Uh, it drives a million people out of their farms and into Syrian cities. Uh, this is enough to uh, uh, help destabilize the already despotic Assad government and set off a brutal civil war. This in turn is enough to put uh, a couple of million refugees fleeing to Western Europe. This in turn is enough to undermine the political stability of a number of countries in Western Europe. 
as you know, anti-immigrant sentiment and things rises. Well, those kind of fragilities and stresses and fracture points aren't something that you can easily model. You know, we don't have a, but they're, they turn out to be extremely real in, in some ways, probably. And those are breaking points that we reach before we reach absolute physical breaking points, probably. So I, I, I think that I think that really going forward, an, an extraordinary amount of the work is going to be done not by physical scientists, but by political scientists, by economists, by people who are reckoning with the, the mess that we've uh, 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 set in motion. Fascinating and also difficult, though, because I mean, and fascinating, and I agree. Uh, we had uh, on cleaning up. I had uh, Lieutenant General Richard Nugie, who uh, led the UK military's response to climate change, wrote their strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely clear climate change is this threat multiplier. Everybody serious in the military would agree with that. The difficulty is that, you know, there was a hailstorm before the French Revolution that destroyed crops in a big arc around Paris that possibly contributed to the French Revolution. There are these instabilities, you know, you can, can go back biblical times, you can go forwards. That, sure. that those have always been with us. And sure, but so, that, so that, it's hard that seems to, it's to hard. Uh... it's not really a science. I guess what I'm where I'm coming to is you say the social scientists, but the plain fact is that they are at best sort of narrative Cassandras, but not really scientists in any meaningful uh, description, are they? Well, I mean, I guess it depends. I mean, I, who cares what the uh, semantics of, of whoever, but, but they have, <laughs> there is valuable information and insight to be gleaned in the way that societies work. And societies work increasingly dysfunctionally at the moment for a variety of reasons, some of them connected to this climate crisis that we're in. In fact, a lot of them connected to it. Um, and, and that has to be reckoned with, you know, um, look, we're in, we're, we're, we're in a, uh, uh, we're on the edge of, uh, well, we're really in the first big land war in Europe right now, since the Second World War. And it's clear that fossil fuel is a major determinant of, you know, uh, 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 why it got started, how it's going to play out, you know, how it works. Um, I think that what's interesting is the way that all these things coincide. And the most interesting is one that you've spent a lot of time working on over the years. That's the rapid and destabilizing plummet in the cost of renewable energy. And I don't think, I think only now are our political systems beginning to take on board what that means. But what that means is potentially astonishing. I mean, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker earlier this year saying that humanity is uh, legitimately at the point where in very short order, we could end the 200,000 year career of setting stuff on fire. You know, we don't need large scale combustion anymore because, you know, the good Lord was kind enough to put a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away in the sky. And we now have the wit to make full use of it. So that turning point as it comes is is just like the climate crisis laden with all kinds of political, social, economic implications for who's powerful, for how politics works, for, you know, on and on and on. It's a fascinating and crucial moment. It is. And I'm smiling because I wrote something on what I call the solar singularity. You know, if you look at all the kind of grown ups who forecast energy mixes, you know, solar becomes 10 percent by, you know, call it 2050 or it becomes 15 percent or it becomes 20 percent. What about if it becomes you know, 150 or 500 percent of current electricity output. And then we just, as you say, we stop burning things and it opens up. Now, the the challenge, though, to come back to the point that um, about the kind of social sciences and the unpredictability is that sounds wonderful and can be sort of packaged into a very positive narrative of empowerment, distributed, uh, you know, removing the, the geopolitical power of some really bad actors. But it, it can also be packaged as something 
um, threatening. I'll tell you, you know, the Ukraine, the Russia's uh, aggression on Ukraine, there is a whole swath of people out there who say that this was enabled by Germany's energy policy of um, shutting nuclear, going for renewables, which become completely dependent on gas then when there's no wind and no sun. And that is what handed the power to Mr. Putin. So on the on the other political side, there's a narrative that says this shift to renewables is destabilizing. Um, it's and, definitely uh, destabilizing. I mean, uh, yeah. it's probably the most destabilizing thing we've done. But that's, I think, if we're smart, we can make it destabilizing in useful ways. And we can undercut things that need to be undercut. I mean, look, the power of Vladimir Putin, the power of the king of Saudi Arabia, the power of the Koch brothers, uh, all dependent on the fact that we currently rely on a fuel that exists in a few scattered places. And so the people who happen to sit on top of them uh, end up with inordinate uh, and unearned power. Um, and we're converting to a technology uh, that relies on uh, resources, sun, wind, uh, human intelligence that are available everywhere around the, the world. Well, but they are also... Um, dependent on Chinese manufacturing, they're dependent on uh, well, in in in, sure. in a range and, and, of different rare earth uh, uh, minerals. Absolutely. And you know. so none of it's none of it's easy. Uh, yeah. None of it's easy or simple. But the but the large scale arc of where we're going is the fascinating thing. And the point is that we need to make that journey quickly, despite all the difficulties, despite the instabilities that it causes. None of them come anywhere near close to the instability caused by allowing the temperature of the planet to go up another degree. Uh, you know, so I mean, that's it. That's the thing always to be borne in mind. I mean, whatever the, the downsides, whatever the difficulties of the changes that we need to make, they are tiny in comparison with the danger, the existential danger that comes with uh, yet more uh, increase in temperature. So I said I'd like to get back to this question of how does one affect change? What yes. is the role of an individual? And I think yes. we've already had a little bit of said, and there was a phrase that you used there, which I found absolutely you know, fantastic, which is um, destabilizing in a useful way. Yes. And that's certainly one of the models is to sort of hack, and I guess I have, in a way, in my career as an energy analyst, I've tried to sort of destabilize some of the orthodoxy around this is how you do utilities have base load, utilities then have peak, you know, uh, gas peakers, and uh, energy is always done like this, that, and the other. So I think I've also been a, a destabilizer, hopefully in a useful way. But there are other models um, in terms of, you know, there's a whole brigade out there that think we should be, you know, just emphasizing fear. There's a whole brigade out there that should, thinks we should just talk about technological solutions. There's there's all sorts of models. How do you navigate that? I mean, do you just do well, destabilizing in a useful way? No, um, I mean, or, or do you play with the full orchestra of? of so I've been doing this longer than just about anybody, almost by definition, having written the first book about it. So I've been, you know, and I, truthfully, I think that you end up doing, if you're honest, you end up doing all these different things at, at, at different points and in different combinations. But you know. I mean, it's entirely appropriate for people to be fearful of uh, uh, of what's coming or what's already happened. That makes sense. It's entirely appropriate for people to be hopeful about the world that we might be able to create if we want to work fast. Uh, it's entirely appropriate uh, uh, for you know everyone to be nervous about uh, uh, whether or not we can get it done, and you know if human systems are capable of moving at the pace that physics now requires. Um, one of the things that I think is important is to remind ourselves that this, though this is, the climate change is filled with traditional political conflicts, industry and environmentalists, Chinese and Americans, Republicans and Democrats. It's different from our normal political debates in that at bottom, at bottom, the fights between human beings and physics. 
And that's a different kind of battle. Most, most uh, uh, political choices that we have to make are in the end reached by, you know, we reach some kind of compromise somewhere in somewhere towards the middle and then come back eventually. And, you know, but that physics doesn't play that particular game. It's going to do what it's going to do. It's set particular physical limits here. Our job is to live up to them. And so that I think stays in the back of my mind at all times as we're dealing with this. And, and climate has become absolutely the front line in culture wars. Um, cl climate, clean energy, these issues seem to have become absolutely amongst the most polarizing out there. Well, yes, I mean, but for particular reasons, let's be clear why. I mean, that wasn't true at the beginning. Uh, in 1988, when Jim Hansen testified before Congress and really set off the public debate about climate change for the first time, um, there wasn't a kind of polarized sense around it. The Republican president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, said, we need to fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. Uh, he was ready to go to work, you know. But the next year, we now know from great investigative reporting, the fossil fuel industry began to coalesce around this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. And they promoted it with extraordinary, uh, with a lot of money and with a lot, you know, they hired a lot of the people who used to work for the tobacco industry and they spent 30 years telling a lie. And it worked <laughs> to the extent, you know, it worked so well that eventually the Republican president of the United States, Donald Trump, was insisting that climate change was a hoax manufactured by the Chinese. You know, a, a, a sentiment so absurd that if you were, sitting next to someone on the train who was muttering like that, you'd get up and change seats, you know? But that's what happens if you have unlimited funds with which to pursue a, a lie. Uh, that lie cost us 30 years. That lie paralyzed uh, at least the American political system in profound ways uh, and, and became the focus, you know, the, the, the fear that we might disrupt the business model of the fossil fuel industry became one of the things that drove the bizarre polarization of American politics. So it's not as if this sort of culture war just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Uh, it was, you know, uh, uh, expertly, expertly fought by people with uh, huge amounts of resources. Happily, happily, people have begun to fight back in, that's why we built movements so we could stand up to that. And at this point, I think, we're reaching the point where that culture war aspect is diminishing. Most people now, because they've seen so many fires and so many floods, and, you know, at a certain point, who are you going to believe? Fox News or your own lying eyes, you know? And so the, the, the polling data shows that there's now a very widespread consensus that we need to take action, even in the United States, which has been the hotbed center of denial because it was the center of the fossil fuel industry. It seems to be something of a pendulum, though, in the Anglo-Saxon world, because, you know, in the UK's trajectory, it was, you know, at that same time, 1988 through till 1992, Margaret Thatcher's leadership as a chemist saying, we've got to deal with this. That's very famously documented. Yes. Um, and we seem for much of the intervening time to have some sort of consensus and some sort of you know, bipartisanship. We have a Climate Change Act, uh, which was passed on a bipartisan basis. With very few people voted against it. We have net zero 2050 enshrined in law. But I guarantee you that what we're going to see this winter is an absolutely concerted and well-funded <laughs> effort to roll all of that back because we're about to see utility bills jump from you know, 1,500 pounds uh, per year average to four, five, 6,000, and renewables are going to be blamed. And the answer is going to be, um, the, the answer is going to be, you know, fracking and nuclear, both of which I have supported, but neither of which are an immediate response. I think the difference is it's going to be much harder to do that. 
yeah. and get away with it because people are just, you know, know more about it. I mean, look, the UK just had its big electricity uh, biannual electricity tender, uh, you know, and the the price uh, the price for uh, wind came back at one quarter of the price of yeah. electricity from natural gas. But, so, but, but the know, general public is not seeing that. What they're yeah. seeing yeah, is I mean, you tell us it's be, cheap, but we're paying ridiculous amounts. And that's be, be there'll be the people debate. continuing to try and demagogue this yeah. right through. I'm just yeah. saying, thank heaven, people have some of yeah. us have done the work to try and at least even the battlefield here a little bit. Now, now in the US, and in large part because of the movements, the various movements, Sunrise Movement, et cetera, and your own 350 and so on, you've now got the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes. And you know th that raises an interesting question vis-a-vis um, -vis the rivalry or the political, this kind of um, uh, those dualities that you mentioned, you know, uh, US, China in particular, because the I've one of the things I find most interesting about it is how it puts the US back into the technology leadership game. You know, yeah. everybody's focused on, oh, it subsidizes this and it gives that tax break and, blah, and et cetera, et cetera. But what I think is fascinating is that it says, US is gonna be in this game and we're in it to try and win. Does competition between China and the US perhaps save the day in the way that 40 years or 30 years, 30 years of trying to get some international agreement, frankly, hasn't? Well, I mean, look, the, getting an international agreement, a vexed business, was important. Uh, the Paris Accords were important. They consolidated a kind of worldwide opinion that we needed to go to work on this, and there was probably no substitute for it. But I, I think it's going to be extremely useful to have the U.S. in this game. I mean, the 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 Inflation Reduction Act is far from perfect and filled with stupid gifts to the fossil fuel industry because they retain a lot of political power. But they didn't have enough political power to completely avoid change anymore, which they've been able to for 30, the 34 years since Jim Hansen testified. Um, and I think that the, that the, I mean, I think that the most important dynamic here, the most hopeful dynamic is the continued learning curve for renewable energy. Um, the fact that every time we double solar installations, the cost comes down another 30%, may be enough wind in the sails with the money that's coming from this new bill to really reorient. And, and if that happens, one of the important outcomes will be that it will redistribute political power. Um, at a certain point, people who set up, you know, batteries and wind turbines and the people who work in EV factories and things will be a more important political block mm -hmm. than people who mine coal and, and run oil companies, because I mean, they're already a more important economic force. Wall Street's already more interested in them than they are in fossil fuels, because that's clearly what's going to make money in the future. Politics is a lagging indicator here, but not forever. So, you know, the, the, this, this shift uh, is clearly underway now. The only, I think the only powerful question here is, can this shift happen fast enough? And if it can't, you know, I mean, look, 50 years from now, we're gonna run the planet on sun and wind because it's you know, as close as we're gonna to get to free. Um, but if it takes 50 years to get there, then the planet we run on sun and wind will be a broken planet. So the remaining question is, can we make this change happen fast enough? And you know, you've laid out all the reasons why it's difficult, you know, um, um, and they're all unimpeachable. And I'm not here to argue that we're necessarily going to make it. I mean, you know, the title of the book I wrote 33 years ago was The End of Nature. I'm not glibly optimistic, but I do think that that's the challenge to see if we can make it happen and make it happen fast. So many resonances there when you talk about we'll get there by 2070. And I've spent you know a big chunk of 20 years saying we will have a low carbon economy. 
we will have it. The only question is, will it be 2100, 2070 or 2050? That's the only thing, you know, that's the only question. Um, and uh, you know, David Attenborough has actually talked about how we're actually at some kind of evolutionary pinch point. If we can get through to 2100, we'll probably be OK. I think but, that's true. Yeah. And, and that's a fascinating uh, that, that's a fascinating insight there. Um, you mentioned Wall Street. And um, I was trying to find out how many times, perhaps you can enlighten us, how many times you've actually been arrested and how many nights you spent in uh, in, in a prison cell, uh, in a jail cell. But definitely one of them was to do with um, protesting Chase Manhattan yes. investment in fossils. So I don't know, perhaps you want to answer the question, how sure. you know, give, it, give us that snippet and then talk about why you got arrested and how and, and what was that about? I've spent, uh, uh, I, I've been arrested more times than I would have anticipated. <laughs> um, given that I'm basically a law-abiding human being. But civil disobedience actually has been important in this movement building. And one of the more recent ones, yes, right before the pandemic, was in the lobby of the Chase branch nearest the nation's capital in Washington. And the reason that we got arrested was to help kick off this campaign that was a little derailed by the pandemic, but has, but has been powerful and is growing even as we speak. It's aimed at making people understand that the, that the big financial players, the big banks, the big asset managers, the big insurance companies are continuing to provide a lifeline to the fossil fuel industry that we need them to cut off. They don't need to cut off all their financial relationships with the oil industry because we still you know, are going to need oil for a few more years. Um, but we need them to stop allowing its expansion, to stop allowing the construction of stuff designed to last for 40 or 50 years into the future, which we can't have. So Chase is the perfect example of this. Uh, it's the biggest fossil fuel lender in the world. Um, it's, it's when we began this campaign, and it was one of our targets and one of our initial accomplishments, the chair, the executive chair of its board of directors was a man named Lee Raymond, who in his earlier incarnation had been CEO of Exxon and really was, you know, at the period when Exxon was writing the climate denial handbook. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, if you wanted to pick one character responsible for as much fossil fueled mayhem as anyone on the planet, he would have been a good choice. And we were able to get him dumped from that position. And we've been able to get these banks over the last two years to enunciate their plans to go to net zero. Now the question is, can we get them to do it quickly and honestly and transparently? And we don't know the answer to that yet. But it's definitely one of the things that we're working hard on. My guess is, given the new climate bill in Congress, that we're probably not going to get a lot more out of Washington anytime soon. Their habit seems to be work up your nerve to do something and then back off for quite a few years, you know. So the next obvious target that's big enough to matter is the, you know, lever marked money. We've pulled the one mark politics pretty close to the ground and now we need to pull the one mark money. And, and so that's what we're busily trying to do, uh, a, a, among other things at Third Act, this group of older uh, people that we're mobilizing. And actually, one of the final episodes of season six, which was just uh, before the summer, was Mindy Luber, who's the president of Ceres, talking yes. about sustainable finance and the role of finance. Um, and how much hope do you really have, or how much... How much weight do you put behind finance? Because, you know, I look at it and there's plenty of money to invest in clean solutions. Yes. And what I see missing is the sort of the, the legislative bravery in energy, in transportation, in agriculture, in infrastructure to drive the demand for that money. You know, you, you, you can't have a bank can't invest or a bank's clients can't invest in something that simply is never going to make money because the regulation allows somebody to undercut it using natural gas or a fossil yeah. or, or something yeah, else. No, absolutely. So and that's that's definitely a big a big part of the story. But the other part of the story is uh, 
truthfully, I think that there's that the that the future is now clear enough that we're going to see big shifts of capital behind renewable energy. I think what we ha have to do at the same time is dry up the capital behind fossil energy, um, yeah. um, because we have to end that story sooner than the oil industry wants to. Everything they're doing now, I mean, they know what the eventual outcome of this story is. Their goal is to keep their business model alive for another couple of decades. Um, and, and if they do, they'll break the planet. So our, our, our job has to be to catalyze the reaction to make it happen faster. And one of the ways to do that is to take on the, their, their I mean, I, I wrote a piece for the New Yorker a couple of years ago called uh, money is the oxygen on which the fires of global warming burn. You know? yeah. And if we can cut off some of that supply, it'll help. None well, of these things get the job done by themselves. This is all part of how you reorient an economy and a planet and a polity around this massive, massive transition. So each thing is it's, uh, you know, a part of this puzzle and none of it is the, the clear answer, the total answer. And I have written uh, in the past about a worry that we would end up with a kind of um, one economy which is clean lots of wind lots of solar all sort of everybody being tremendously european and and but then another economy if we don't shut off the investment and the funds and the uh the growth of the other economy the dirty economy the polluting and emitting economy then we kind of get nowhere because you just have yes some... i think that's correct i think the thing that's helping us now is that the the falls in the price of renewable energy have been so large so steady yeah. so sustained that that investors with any sense um, are worried right. about stranding assets if they continue to build fossil fuel infrastructure. That'll help, but there's a lot of momentum and a lot of political power yeah. behind this industry. Now, and I want to you know, mention also you know, stuff analysis that I've done of the cost of capital and the divestment movement, your divestment movement, pushed up the cost of capital for coal businesses in the West yep. to 20 30%. Yep. and made them uneconomic and finished yep. them that was you know that 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 was that yep. uh, so cr credit to that but there's one thing that you keep referring to the oil industry the oil industry and you know oil and gas would be a better way of saying it yes well oil and gas but also um i want to challenge you because you know you, you have been in, arrested lots of times yes. and you've you know had an enormous string of successes but i notice that you don't go to china and protest against Sinopec or to Malaysia mm -hmm. and prote protest against Petronas mm -hmm. or Saudi Arabia and protest against Aramco. And frankly, mm -hmm. these are much bigger players, certainly in oil, they are now much bigger players. Coal India, Coal India dwarfs Peabody or anybody in the U in the US. Well, yes. and this is, I mean, How, what's so your theory of dealing with those? Because, you know, are, are you not, isn't the risk that we just kind of end up you know, Europe, maybe the US, Japan, South Korea, a bunch of countries doing the right thing. But frankly, it's irrelevant relative to the scale of what's sure. happening elsewhere. Sure. That's why we set up 350.org as a global operation from the beginning. And in fact, we've done big protests in China, in India, elsewhere. As you know, it's hard to do that. They're authoritarian governments that, you know, even India now becoming authoritarian governments that don't brook much opposition. Um, it's also true, however, it's pretty easy to overstate this case too. I mean, uh, 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 you know, Luke Oil and uh, Gazprom and stuff can't operate at the level they want to without Exxon providing expertise and capital. You know, that's been the model that's, you know, happened around the world. So going after the uh, Western oil companies has been an effective and important part of this. But yeah, I mean, do, do I wish we lived in a world where it was uh, possible to be uh, uh, acting democratically in as many places as possible? Yeah. And it's one of the things that we fight for. And I, one of the reasons why I think the, um, the, um, the conference of the parties, the UN talks in Egypt will be interesting this year. It'll be one of the first times that they're held in a semi-authoritarian country uh, with a lot of political prisoners and things. And I think that it'll that it, it, it'll heighten that 
emphasis on the democracy deficit. I was very conscious at Glasgow looking around at how much had changed since Paris, uh, that you now had a far more authoritarian China, India, you, Brazil had become a, a semi-fascist, you know, uh, uh, authoritarian government. Uh, the United States had emerged from Trump, but just barely. Um, you know, the space for democratic action is definitely reduced. And it is one of the reasons why it's important that we hit hard those places where we can hit. I'm very conscious of time, but I've got one uh, final question that I'd like to uh, sure. raise, and that is um, the just transition. Right? There's a lot of talk about a just transition, and it's generally framed around vulnerable societies being involved in decision making. Um, it's framed around um, the, the in, well, inclusion in decisions and also in the economic kind of output so that it's not just uh, the benefits going to Wall Street traders, but it's also going out into communities that have suffered in some cases you know, tremendously under the old fossil uh, arrangements, fossil regime. But there is another aspect of a just transition, and that is access to cheap energy for poor and vulnerable people. Yep. And that generally hasn't been a big part of the debate over the last few decades. I mean, it really hasn't. So what we've got is conversations about um, you know, we must have a carbon price and a carbon tax, which is all very well, except the theory of a carbon price is we'll drive up the cost of bad thing until good thing becomes cheaper. Yeah, that and in seems... that arc, people suffer. And we still yes, saw absolutely. that last year. We're seeing that now. How do you respond to that? And that, the, you know, the carbon price thing seems to me to be, especially after the passage of the climate bill in the U.S., less of a feature of uh, the political response at this point. I think in the largest sense, we're actually at a moment when access to energy, affordable energy to people is going to be, uh, we can head in an entirely new direction. I did a piece, a series of pieces for The New Yorker a couple of years ago, traveling to Africa, watching places that were never going to get energy off the grid, suddenly able to get it because the price of solar panels had fallen so far. And it was quite remarkable. I mean, um, um, there's a billion people on the planet without access to electricity now, more people without access to electricity than when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Um, but the UN estimates that almost all of that gap is going to be closed by renewable energy over the next 50 years, almost none of it by fossil energy, just because it's cheaper. And it really did bring home to me in the most powerful way what a, uh, what a privilege and joy it is to be alive at a moment when the cheapest, easiest way to generate power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. I mean, that is, that is a quantum shift. Right. And, and, and I was on the high level advisory group for sustainable energy for all before it was even called that. And, yes. uh, and um, I've been, you know, I'm an investor in solar in Africa, yes. I've put solar into a neonatal clinic in Africa, and it is incredibly uplifting to, to see that trend. By the way, it's about 700 million who don't have access to electricity. And that number has never been smaller since the beginning of electricity. Yes. Good. Um, so I'm enormously heartened. I'm, I'm with you on that. But we also, over the last eight years, since 2014, we, you, halved the amount of investment in fossil fuels. I had Alain Ebobisse, an infrastructure investor, uh, CEO of um, Africa 50, which is an infrastructure fund, and asking him what he wanted out of Glasgow, his answer was, don't prevent us, don't block finance for natural gas because you're all keeping the lights on with natural gas in Europe, in the US, and you want to stop us doing that. What do you, how do you answer that? Isn't it a sort of neo-colonialism to say, don't worry, you'll get solar in 50 years. It'll no, all be I don't think so. My, my colleagues across Africa, all the people at 350 Africa who are all in these countries working hard are doing their very best to stop pipelines and things for precisely the same reasons we're doing it here. They know that Africa is the place most vulnerable, most susceptible to rise in temperature. And they know that there is a uh, clean energy future out there. 
it may not involve quite the same elites who have uh, you know, who, who you've been talking to, who want to make a lot of money off natural gas in Africa, but go talk to young people across the continent. Uh, they're on board with the clean energy revolution. Um, and, and, and they're some of my favorite colleagues out there. The colonial, the colonial plans are the ones like this East Africa crude oil pipeline. These are just last gasps of a, you know, a dying worldview. And the sooner we get past them, the better off we're going to be. Bill, it's been an enormous honor uh, having you on Cleaning Up. Unfortunately, we're out of time and I won't be able to open it. There's a whole other topic I'd love to talk to you about. <laughs> you wrote a book called Long Distance. There you go. I've, I've raced the Engadin Ski Marathon. <laughs> you dedicated a whole year to doing cross-country skiing. Yes, you know, we are in some ways two old leathery mountain well, men. You ought to be talking about that. And absolutely, but of course it connects right up because there's no activity on earth more vulnerable to the rise in temperature than cross-country skiing. <laughs> so so well, let's that one more good reason to try and keep the planet looking something like the one we were born on to. You, you certainly have to change your choice of waxes. There's no question <laughs> about that. <laughs> All right. Many thanks. This is a real pleasure. Take good care, friend. M many thanks. Thanks to you, Bill. So that was Bill McKibben, writer and activist, founder of 350.org, The Divestment Movement, and Third Act. Our guest next week is Dev Sanyal. Dev was a 30-year veteran of BP and a protege of Lord Brown, our guest on episode 50 of Cleaning Up. He is now the CEO of Varro Energy, one of the largest investors in the world in biofuels and dedicated to investing in sustainable and clean energy. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Dev Sanyal. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.